Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're watching from, and welcome to AXA Coral Live. Delighted to have you all with us. We're broadcasting live from the Kamabi Research Station on the island of Curaçao. Now that's a Caribbean island towards the south, north of Venezuela, and makes up part of the ABC Islands. So we have Aruba and Bonaire as well to make up A, B and C. And we're based at the Kamabi Research Station, an amazing facility, both having long-term resident science projects and providing a home from home for visiting scientists. And for all those scientists, Kamabi is important in two ways. As a field research station, it has research facilities so that scientists can be working in the dry labs, examining their samples, maybe using microscopes to get that even closer view of life on the reef, and also wet labs. And those are great uh, for making mini oceans in aquaria and isolating certain factors that may affect life on the reef. Now, Kamabi isn't just a research facility, it's a field research facility, and it's here for a reason, and that's the proximity to the reef, just 50 meters offshore from where we are at the moment, and even coral growing on the sides of this jetty we're sitting on. And that means that scientists can be working their lab, doing the research, and then get into the amazing underwater world using scuba gear, and maybe if they're going deeper on the reef, using rebreather technology. We heard from Pim all about that yesterday. So what's really, really great is just here, the wonderful world of coral, the ability to study it, and all that packaged together makes Kamabi a really special place to be working from. So welcome to all those schools, to this Ask Me Anything Coral Q&A. And it's a big welcome to Rene as well. Thank you so much um, for joining us, Rene. It's really wonderful to have you here. And we've got lots and lots of schools watching. Really looking forward to hearing more and getting into depth about the impact of climate change on, on the reef. And we'll do that to start with. But let's just welcome some of our, our classes first. And we, we have um, classes from Croatia. Hi to everyone in Croatia. We've got uh, UK, uh, Colombia. Hi to you guys, Bermuda and the USA. And we've got some special shout outs to give as well. Um, we have, um, we've got so many primary schools from Bermuda who are tuning in. Um, so a massive hello to Purvis. Hi. Um, to all the students at Northlands. Hi. Good morning. Morning. Um, and to Victor Scott Primary as well. So hi to all the students and teachers from Victor Scott. Um, we've got a big hello um, from the INEM science class and they're in Bogota in oh, Colombia. That's just here. So uh, it's just here. Yeah. Uh, and thank you to the students of River City Science Academy for tuning in from the USA. So great to have you with us. Um, hi to Riders Hayes in the UK. Uh, wonderful to have you with us again. And a big, big welcome to Union Point Academy also watching from the USA. Now, often our Ask Me Anything, our Coral Q&A sessions are really driven by the questions we get sent for each particular uh, live lesson. But we've had so many questions about the impact of global warming on the coral reef. We wanted just to take this opportunity to break that down in a bit more depth. And Rene, thank you so much for, for being here to, to help us with that. Thanks for having me. Um, briefly, before we start, um, what's, what's been your career in, 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 in coral, coral science? What kind of things do you, do you study? Um, so the last five to seven years, I've mostly focused on uh, coral physiology, which is the working of the animal okay. uh, as an individual organism and to look within that animal how certain processes work and it, if that affects the health and the survival of that animal. Amazing and um, w w you've, you're, you're here now in Curaçao, you're, you're from Curaçao? I am, yes. Uh, and w have you, have you, has it all been, always been working here? Uh, no, I've traveled quite a bit. Um, so I got exposed to uh, marine biology uh, in the beginning here about probably 15 years ago. And then uh, when I was a bit older, I went to the Netherlands to study, lived there for about six years, 
then moved to Australia uh, for another five years where I've done my uh, uh, took my doctoral degree okay and just finished last year and congratulations I'm back. thank you yeah um, yeah and since a year and a half I'm back on Curacao I'm um, setting up a project here to look at the physiology of the corals living on the on the very deep parts of the reef so below okay. 60 meters below 60 meters below that, 60, yeah. that, that is deep so you're you're on the reef breathers as well I am not no no mm -hmm. I'm not uh, technical diving certified um, but people help me collecting the specimens when I need them mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the work as you mentioned earlier because we have the wet labs I can do a lot of the work here once I've got the specimens okay I can do them here in the lab so that's really convenient makes it a bit easier than, than, oh, than yeah. using the technical diving equipment yes 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 um, so Ronnie, you, you, you I, we, we spoke before the session about, about this this great concern that students watching have had driven by the, the stories in, in the media and what was, we're talking about the impact of climate change yep. of course you know we've got this increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and that, that has two effects on the ocean doesn't it? It does yes so on the one hand the increase in carbon in the atmosphere um, as you know carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas so it increases uh, the rate at which the heat from the earth is radiated back to the earth instead of escaping into space and that heats the system up uh, quite a bit so that's the first effect well some of that heat of the warming atmosphere will warm the oceans as well mm -hmm. so then the seawater temperature goes up and that has all sorts of uh, problems for corals as we'll see in a bit now the second effect of increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is that a lot of that carbon roughly uh, one third of it is being absorbed by the ocean and when it's being absorbed by the ocean uh, it reacts with the water in the ocean and it forms a very weak acid uh -huh. and with that acid the acidity of the ocean goes up um, and as we'll go into detail a little bit later that makes it very much harder for the corals to grow and to build their skeleton so that's the two effects so it's a warming and this process called acidification exactly yes okay so and 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 why do those let's take warming first why why does that matter to the health of coral um, corals are very finely adapted to living in a very stable environment and have uh, been so for the last 40, 50, 60,000 years. So they're very well adapted to a very steady environment, particular in terms of temperature. Now, at the same time, corals have also evolved a symbiotic relationship with a very small algae that's too small to see with the naked eye. Can we break that down, the symbiosis part yes. for the primary schools okay. watching? So symbiosis is when two animals live together, um, not simply with each other, but within each other's tissue. Um, and that has a mutual benefit for each organism. So it's not like a parasite that could live inside of you and then take all sorts of things from you and make you sick but each of the two has a, a positive benefit for the other. And it's all living things or as well as animals? Yes, yeah. okay. so you, you often have uh, these relationships between animals um, and fungi or okay. animals and microbes such as bacteria and in this case it's between an animal, the coral, and a very small algae which mm -hmm. is closely related to plants okay. um, that lives inside their tissue. Okay. Now, this relationship between the animal and that microalgae is very beneficial uh, for both of them because the algae gets a stable place where it can live and grow. Mm -hmm. um, but because it's an algae, it does photosynthesis. So it turns energy from the sun into um, organic compounds, basically into energy that the coral can use to grow. Um, now, what happens when the temperatures increase very much is that relationship is put under pressure. Um, for reasons that are very elaborate to explain now, so we might go into detail yeah. later. Um, but let's for now say that when the temperature increases too much, that relationship starts to break down. It's no longer beneficial for the corals to have these algae. And as a result, they're expelled from the tissue um, and the, the relationship is broken. And then the coral doesn't get this energy anymore from the algae that it would get otherwise. And they will eventually starve if they don't recover in time. And so, so how much, I mean, it's, it's, it's a terrible process, but so how, how much energy, what percentage of the energy is coming from this algae? It depends per species, but this can be quite a lot. Uh, it could be anywhere between 50 and 95 percent. 95 percent? 95, yeah. That's it's incredible. quite a bit. And, and I've, I've come across this term coral bleaching, and I yes. think probably some of the schools in Bermuda might, might have, you know, the local coral bleaching. Yeah. Bleaching is, is this thing that you use on your clothes to make them white. Why That's do we? Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So the thing is, when you see a living coral, a healthy coral with all the color, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Um, say a small coral, the color of the coral itself, um, because it only covers a very thin layer of tissue on the outside of what would otherwise be the rock, it's so thin and the coral tissue itself is almost transparent for that reason. Um, and when you see a coral with all the beautiful colors, it's actually the uh, pigments of the algae inside the tissue that give it its color. Now what happens when the algae are removed from the tissue, you will see the bare limestone that's underneath the tissue, which is white. Uh, and that's why they call it coral bleaching, because all of a sudden the coral appears completely pale and white like this one. Okay. Incredible. And, and so when that, that food source goes, then, then, then there is essentially starvation. Yes. So what happens is, uh, the coral has another way of feeding, which is to grab prey with its tentacles, particularly at night, and ingest those, um, which can compensate for a little bit of that loss. And what they do additionally is they uh, use up their energy reserves, so their okay. lipid stores. Fast. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so they can survive for a little while, sometimes up to three or four weeks. Um, but if they don't recover and get the algae back in time, they will eventually starve because they deplete all their energy stores and the feeding isn't enough to compensate. So they will just die of starvation. Wow. Okay. That, that sounds like a fairly bleak, bleak picture. What I'd like, like to do is, is, is we can come on to sort of what we've seen and, and what the wider sort of ecosystem impacts are. Um, but could you, we talked a little bit about this thing, ocean acidification yes. as well in your introduction. So how, how is that? And I think if we bring, bring the coral up, a little bit more than we can we can get that at the same time but sort of how is ocean acidification affecting what's going on here yeah. so the coral skeleton is made up of a mineral uh, called calcium carbonate which is uh, roughly the same mineral that makes up a lot of our bones and the thing with calcium carbonate is it is uh, easy to lay down in the form of a skeleton when the conditions are not not acidic and mm -hmm. the more acidic the conditions get the energy required to lay this material down goes up to the point um, where it tips the other way. So if the oceans become too acidic, these skeletons will actually start dissolving no way. for purely uh, chemical and physical reasons. And and so what what I mean what options does the uh, coral animal have in a more acidic ocean? Not necessarily where it's dissolving, but where there's less available mineral to, to build its its, its structure. Yeah. Well, so sometimes what you see in the worst case, you see that coral growth ceases completely or uh, becomes negative, so they start to shrink. Um, in some cases, you see that the quality of the mi mineral, because it has a certain structure, if the, the quality can become less. Uh, and in some cases, corals adapt to it quite well and they start to uh, build more uh, fleshy biomass rather than skeleton. Um, and that enables them to survive actually for quite a long time. Okay, and um, so with this, I mean, this sounds fairly sort of like dire sort of like situations. We've got the, the, the bleaching from warming and the, the weaker or back re re reduced structure yes. um, from acidification. Are we seeing this already in the ocean? Yes, we are, unfortunately. Um, the effects so far are quite mild, um, but we are definitely seeing it and it's getting more intense uh, recently. So the phenomenon of bleaching was largely unknown um, before the 90s, but since the 90s we've had uh, quite some episodes of global coral bleaching, so that corals on all parts of uh, the earth, particularly in the, in the close tropics, are bleaching extensively, sometimes associated with El Nino years, which is like an irregular uh, year for weather, weather-wise. Um, but we're seeing this more and more, and as we speak actually this year, we have quite a bit of coral bleaching on the reefs of Curaçao uh, now, particularly on the deeper parts, so below 20 meters. And, and are we seeing any recovery after those bleaching events, or, 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 or is that just, you know, every time there's this big bleaching event, that's a bit of coral reef that's gone forever? Not entirely. So we do see recovery, uh, fortunately. When the temperature goes down again, uh, um, if it doesn't last too long, the corals will start to take these algae back in, uh, gets the color back and they will recover. But we always experience a little bit of mortality uh, because some corals, they might be already stressed before the bleaching happens. They don't recover so well, so the, the weak ones die. 
Um, and sometimes when it's really severe, that percentage that doesn't recover can be quite high. So it's estimated, for example, that on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, where I've spent some work the last five years, um, the bleaching in 2016 and 2017 has got rid of almost 50% of the corals in the shallow reef. And, and that's just, that's pretty well gone. Yes, uh, so these are dead. Um, there could be new recruitment of new corals, yeah. uh, but the recruitment is a very, very slow process. So at the moment, it's not recovered. Um, and th that space is, at the moment, it's, it's bare, it's empty. Um, but yeah, no, recovery is definitely possible. The problem with recovery is it takes a long time and this bleaching gets more and more frequent. So the periods where the corals get a temporary setback after one of these uh, temperature mm -hmm. episodes become so frequent that the intermittent time for recovery is not sufficient anymore. So that's the problem we're, we're facing now. And I, I think we've, there's some work done on, on Heron Island um, where I think you may have been, not, not, not your, your work, but sort of work that you were sort of- Yes, my colleagues. Your colleagues were yes, working on. Yes, my colleagues. On. Uh, and th they made uh, sort of artificial mini oceans. Yes. Uh, and they put different species of coral in it. And, and, and um, what they did, I think, was that they gave those different mini oceans different conditions. That's I right. think. Yes. And s some conditions were like before the Industrial Revolution, before mm -hmm. most, of, and then now. Yes. And then looking into the future. And looking into the future. Yeah. So we've got a bit of time travel. Yes, we I, do. I think we, we, we can do. And I think we've got some, some time lapse video um, from these mini oceans, from these mesocosms. Uh, and if we, if we start with the first one, if we start with the pre industrial um, ones, and, and just, just tell students what, what they might be, might, might be seeing. Yeah. So before the Industrial Revolution, um, there was much less carbon into the atmosphere uh, than now. It was slightly more than one degree centigrade cooler than now. Um, and also the ocean was less acidic as it is now. So essentially what we have is we have ideal conditions uh, under which corals have existed for many okay. years until we started disturbing the system. Um, and they recreated those and essentially sort of went back in time to simulate how it would be on a coral reef if this had never taken place. Yep. Um, and when you look at that time lapse, it takes, it's, uh, it's an experiment that runs over one whole year. If you look at the time lapse, you see that, well actually, you don't see very much change. So the corals, the corals are very similar throughout the whole year. Um, and if you, if you pay attention closely, you will see that there's no bleaching occurring during those months. Brilliant. And uh, how, have, how have those conditions changed? Um, we've got one on the present day, so what kind of changes might, might we see? For the present day, uh, we are uh, roughly 140. So, okay, let me rewind that a little bit back. So in the pre-industrial uh, times, yep. we had roughly what they call 280 parts per million parts of carbon dioxide yep. per million parts in the atmosphere. At the moment, that's roughly 420. So we went up significantly by 180, uh, sorry, 140 parts per million already. Mm -hmm. um, and that's now. The temperature has gone up by roughly one degree. And you see that you will get coral bleaching, but only really in the summers. So okay. in the hottest months of the year, you might get some coral bleaching, but not necessarily every year. Mm -hmm. And for most part, uh, the corals are still doing pretty well. Okay, so, so and if we, if we watch through this, what we'll see is through the year, in the colder months, we will have more of that darker color, yeah. and, and then on in the warmer months, we'll see a sort of paling. There might be. Um, I don't. I think the year in which we ran that experiment, there was no bleaching. Um, mm -hmm. So even in the summer months, there might have been a little bit, but it wasn't anything significant. Um, you will really see the significant ones once we start extrapolating into the future. So well, let's get into our time machine, and we've got two scenarios to look at. Yes. One's called a reduced emissions scenario, and one's called a business as usual scenario. What, what, what's, what's, what's going on behind these terms? Yeah. So in both of these scenarios, we will assume that carbon emissions will continue to rise, except the speed with which they rise will be different. So with the reduced emission scenarios, we will continue to emit but the emissions every year will be less until we're uh, not emitting any, so no net emissions by 2050. And in the business, business as usual scenario, we will continue to emit steadily as we are doing now, all the way through the end of the century. Oof. So, so let, let's look at what the reef could look like 
even if we aim for that zero net emissions by 2050. By 2050. So we're going to going to get that up there. What 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 might we see in our in our you know let's let's make a change by 2050. So because we will still have uh, emissions uh, in the years to come under this scenario, and because there's still a, there's a lagging effect of the carbon that's already in the atmosphere because of what we've already done in the last hundred years uh, that hasn't warmed up yet and it will still happen so what you will see is that uh, under that scenario the temperature will continue to increase for roughly um, a half a degree to one degree more than what we have so 1.5 to 2 above pre-industrial mm. and you will see that that really starts to make corals bleach uh, especially in the summer and what we also see in that time lapse is that the recovery under that two degree increase is not as good um, as we might hope that it would be. So the corals don't recover and a few species will actually die towards the end of the experiment. So that sounds pretty bad. What happens if we, if we just don't do anything? That's what we sometimes call the worst case scenario and that's really worst case. We predict that or with very high certainty that the temperature will go up as much as four and a half degrees as much as the pre-industrial level by the end of the century and under that scenario you will get total bleaching of almost every species of coral uh, not only during the summer but well before that in spring when temperatures aren't even at their annual maximum and almost no recovery at all. Um, all the corals will die and the system will be uh, dominated by algae at the end of the experiment. I'm feeling quite sad. Sh should, should I be feeling quite sad? Um, not per se. Um, we have the latest reports indicate that we have quite a gap where we can do a lot to avoid this scenario. Um, the agreement in Paris in 2015, what uh, 185 countries signed, the key finding or the key agreement uh, in that pact was that to absolutely limit the warming of the global uh, ocean and, and, and climate by a maximum of two degrees above pre-industrial levels. We're one degree now, so we haven't got to two degrees yet, but that every aim or every measure should be taken to try to limit it not to two degrees, but to one and a half, because one and a half seems to be sort of a critical uh, value where we think the recovery of the whole system will be, will be quite plausible. Um, at the moment, we're not at one and a half degree yet. We have a window under business as usual scenarios, we will have closed that window, that gap that we still have in 10 years exactly. So by 2030 roughly. If we slowly build it off, we might be able to close that gap uh, not until 2050. So we have time to do something about it and then keep that temperature uh, to as low as we can, ideally below 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial level. So there's, there's a gap that we have, but every time, every year that we wait, we lose that time. And that, that's, that's just consistent big action across a whole range. Yes. You know, everything from our own individual behavior to the way that businesses run, how we move around the planet and how governments legislate. Yes, yes, everything has to change. Um, it doesn't have to happen immediately. Like I said, we have that window. Um, but the longer we wait, the smaller that window become and the more changes we have to cram in a shorter time span. So if these changes happen slowly but, but steadily over the next five years and start to be implemented, we, that window will grow. Instead okay. of 10 years, it will become 30 years and we can actually do something. So it's not there yet. So, so let's start immediately, let's get on this path and let's slowly build things up. It doesn't need that sharp shock of massive change, mm. but it will do if we just don't, don't take any action. Yes. So. To put it in numbers, we have that gap that I was talking about is, is they call it, they, they measure it in terms of carbon emitted. That's 420 gigatons roughly, that's a lot of carbon, but we emit roughly 42 a year last year. So with the rate of last year, we have 10 years before that gap's gone and we estimate with, with quite a good certainty that if we emit all of that 420 tons of carbon, the changes will almost certainly be irreversible. So we have to make sure we don't get to the, the number of yeah, 420. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Um, so so I, I hear hope, I hear the need for action. And, Definitely. Um, and then I, you know, we, we, we've had one view or two views into possible futures 
um, for, for, for the reef. Yes. Um, we've, we've got, um, thank you so much. I mean, that, that I learned a lot and I'm sure that a lot of the students um, at home have learned a lot well. We've got some really great questions coming, coming through th for them. Um, we're going to start in Northwest Primary in Bermuda. Okay. Um, Haley would like to know, um, how do corals change their color? Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, I'll pick up this rock again. This is a bare coral skeleton. There's no tissue on here, so this is all dead and dry. This is the coral of the calcium carbonate underneath the coral. The tissue itself, like I said earlier, is so thin, it hardly has any color of its own. So what gives it all these colors ranging from blue, uh, sometimes green, brown, yellow, to purple and even red, is the pigment of the algae that live inside the tissue primarily and sometimes a few other pigments of other organisms associated with that whole system. Um, and these pigments are incredibly diverse. Uh, algae uh, have many different pigments inside their own tissue for dealing with many different uh, aspects from uh, fixating uh, carbon through photosynthesis or for uh, getting rid of excess energy from that okay. same process and these pigments have a certain color or a combination of colors and that's what ultimately gives the coral the color that you see when you look at them on the reef. Amazing, thank you. Yeah. Um, how, this is from Kaylin, also at Northlands, how do they know when the coral are sick? How, how do we know? Yeah. Well, the most obvious thing would be the bleaching. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very easy to identify because the coral, there's no white corals out there that are healthy. So as soon as you see these corals starting to pale and eventually become white, you immediately know something's up. Uh, other things are a little bit more elaborate. For example, the coral might not be bleached but might be unhealthy. And then we can look at things, for example, as the efficiency with which they photosynthesize or the amount of lipids they have in their tissue. We can measure those things um, and then we can derive some sort of a health measure from those measurements. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. Uh, Riley's got a great question. Uh, we see all kinds of different shapes of coral on the reef. How are corals different shapes? That's, that's a very interesting question. It's a very elaborate one. I'll only highlight a few ways. Um, because uh, corals are very different shapes. Like this one, for example, is shaped like a brain. We call these, uh, this group of corals, we call them brain corals. And sort of the generic shape is made up a lot just by the genetic material in the coral. But there's very subtle differences, for example, between corals that grow in different habitats. So the environment uh, is not going to change the way that the ridges look as a whole. It will still look like a brain, but the ridges might be flatter or they might be higher, they might be further apart. Um, and those smaller changes are very much due to the environment. So for example, how much light gets there, uh, how, uh, how warm is it, what the uh, acidity of the ocean, how good does it calcify. And you see, for example, that corals that live very deep uh, in the ocean where there's very little light often have very thin plates um, so that almost like a saucer, big, and they're always facing up. Like almost like a solar panel. Is that yes, right? exactly. Yeah. Well, that's essentially what it is because they, they orient themselves that way or they, they, they grow in that shape because then they can harvest as much light that comes in at these great depths as, as possible. And that same species, for example, when you see it in the shallows where there's a lot more light, tend to be a little bit thicky, a little bit crusty, uh, more ridges, whereas the one in the deep is very nice and, and flat just to maximize that irradiance coming in. Amazing. Uh, I, this is a, a question from Cash. Um, we, we saw earlier um, with Kristen a single coral polyp and you've been holding up this, this bit of boulder coral. This one, yeah. Uh, how, do, how does coral grow? How does it go from that single polyp to a colony like this? Yeah. So the coral starts as a single polyp and all the polyps that subsequently make up this colony of polyps are clones of that very first polyp. That sounds like a science fiction film. Almost, almost. So what happens is, it sounds really weird, but it's really simple. So essentially what the, what the polyp does is it splits every now and then. Um, so that initial polyp will split at one point and then there'll be two polyps. Then each of those can split and there'll be four. And each of those uh, polyps will continue to grow outwards until you have a colony like this one made up of hundreds of polyps each growing outwards and then what you get is that the boulder just starts to rise 
And then it's taking the minerals in the ocean to, to make the structure. To build that skeleton, exactly. Each polyp does that individually and collectively they make that whole structure. Incredible, incredible, thank you. Well, we're now moving to River City Science Academy. Um, so hi to all the students there. Um, and, and Brennan would like to know, um, what exactly do you study in, in terms of coral reefs? You touched on it a little bit before, Yeah. but maybe just a little bit more for, for Brennan. Okay, sure. Um, I'll, r I'll run you through. Um, so, like I said, I work with the physiology, which is really the functioning of the organism. And doing my work, I focus a lot on how does the coral get its energy, yeah. how much does it get, and particularly what I'm interested in is how does it use that energy to um, try to maximize many different processes. Because all the processes in the animal, they cost energy. So you have, for example, defense against uh, disease. Mm -hmm. You have growth, which also costs energy. You have reproduction. And what I want to know is, based on the energy that the coral gets, they have like a budget, how does it spend that on all these different processes? How does that depend on the environment? So how much influence does the environment have in changing that? Um, can we, for example, associate trade-offs? Does it mean that if the coral maximizes growth, it has to reduce reproduction because it cannot simultaneously do them, or can it simultaneously elevate these processes? Um, so are there trade-offs? And what happens, for example, when the corals is really, really stressed? So I do experiments when the corals are stressed, for example, with increased temperature or acidification, and I see how the system breaks down, uh, and I try to, from that, uh, work out what the cellular processes are that are at the basis of the changes that we see when you look at a coral going pale. Incredible. So, so a lot of the detail, uh, almost like a sort of polyp doctor and researching the sort of almost the medical side of what, what are those sort of changes going on inside. Mm, except that I'm not so much... Uh, <laughs> Um, so I, I, I know a lot about when it goes wrong, I know a lot about what to do when it gets better, but that's really hard to yeah. implement. Yeah. So I'm not really a doctor and no, says yeah, that yeah. I, don't, I don't cure them no, when no, they're no, sick. Cure them, but it's almost that sort of an anatomical, physiological... Yeah, I'm more the one who tries to find out why they get sick why and get why sick. the recovery is sometimes so low and how that can be improved and so forth. We've been hearing about all this amazing research going on at, um, at Camarbio and, and beyond this week. Um, Cameron would like to know, how, how is research funded? How, how, how does your research get funded? That's, that's probably the hardest part of everything. Um, because funding is not easy to come by uh, often. Uh, and it, the problem also is that research costs a lot. Um, and uh, it's not that we're getting really exorbitant salaries, but a lot of the experiments, uh, like the ones that you see in the videos from about the mesocosms, yeah. they need a lot of money to build. Uh, they need a lot of money to pay technicians to keep it running. Like this one ran yeah. for a year. There was a couple of people employed to just you know, maintain and, and uh, keep that system running. Um, then we need to pay for a lot of analysis. So it's a lot of money. So what we usually do is we we, from our work, we identify problems, we identify knowledge gaps, yeah. and then we write a proposal to a grant organization or a government or a non-governmental uh, institute where we outline the significance of this uh, project, of this experiment, for example, what we can learn from it, and we ask them to fund that. Now, when they receive a lot of these proposals from us and from other scientists, yeah. they're going to review those because they cannot fund all of them. They review them and they'll pick the best ones and the most promising ones, uh, and these will get the funding, and the other ones get declined, and then we have to apply to different, to different organizations. Sounds, sounds tough. It is a bit tough, and it's, um, it's probably where a good deal of my time, probably about 25% of my time, really? goes into applying for funding, yes. Wow. Because if I want to have, say that I have funding now for a year to do my work here yeah. and my experiments, but I need to start applying already now because when that funding runs out, because it always takes so long, yep. I need to start applying now because if it runs out and I start applying then, yep. I won't have funding for another year before I might get another fund. Wow. Um, so to go from, from the difficulties of uh, funding to Olivia would like to know, how deep can you dive? How deep can I dive? I can only say how deep I've been, which is not crazy deep. I think the deepest dive I've made is 53 meters, um, but colleagues of mine uh, dive a lot deeper. The project that we're working on now 
deals with corals uh, below 60 meters. Yep. Um, I'm not a technical diver. I haven't had the proper training. I would never recommend uh, anyone without the proper training to go there. That's why yep. I'm, I'm not diving to 60 meters. But most of my dives, uh, honestly, uh, mostly between the, the 8 and 30 meter range. Okay. That would be also where you would find most of the reefs here on Curacao and actually in, in most parts of the world because that's the area that receives the most sunlight. When you go much deeper than that, the corals will mm -hmm. be much less anyway. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, Kaylee would like to know uh, an, uh, an, another question for uh, underwater. Uh, sh she's asked, um, what is the biggest fish on the reef? And uh, maybe you can also mention the biggest fish that you've seen on the reef. The, the biggest fish uh, officially is the whale shark. Uh, we don't get it here in Curacao very often. We're not inside the, the sort of migratory route that they do. Um, I have seen one here in Curacao from a boat once. Um, it wasn't very spectacular because it was on a boat and it was far away. I've seen them in Australia um, and they're massive. We've seen one that was nine meters. Nine meters? Nine meters. It was wow, unbelievable. It was this whole wall of animal coming towards you. Um, but, but in fact, most of the fish aren't, aren't that big. I think the biggest fish that you would encounter here in the Caribbean, which is quite heavily overfished, uh, if you're really lucky, you can encounter like a, a, a two-meter uh, pelagic fish browsing the edges of the reef or a two-meter grouper. They're very rare, but they're still around. Thank you. We've got um, questions now pre-submitted from, from Bogota, and then we've got a quick fire round uh, as we take some of the questions that have come over the live chat. Okay. Um, from Bogota, we have, uh, what instruments do you use to collect your data? Oh, um, we have a lot of instruments at our disposal. It used not to be that way about 10 years ago, um, but the progress in the field of marine biology has gone really rapidly. One of the biggest problems that we used to have is that a lot of the machinery or the equipment that we had before wasn't waterproof. So we could use it in the lab, but couldn't touch water, let alone go on a yeah. dive and measure stuff. But we've really made a lot of effort to uh, build special housings and casings that would be resistant to that. Um, but to answer your question specifically, it really depends on what you want to know. Um, so we have very fancy tools nowadays where we can, for example, measure or approximate the photosynthesis of a coral as it's growing on the reef, which is like this box that we take down, we can put it on the coral, we can measure all these things instantly. Some things are obviously uh, really simple, like a thermometer, if you want to know what the water temperature is, or a light meter. Um, some analysis can be really elaborate, where you, for example, if I want to know um, the amount of, let's say, the amount of pigment, remember the one that gives the color to the coral, yep. inside the algae, I would have to take a sample to the lab, get the tissue, separate it, purify it, and then run it through uh, like really complex machines. So it, it really depends from, from very simple to incredibly elaborate. Uh, amazing. But we can, all, we can do all these things amazing. nowadays. I mean, it's amazing how, how the, the, the techniques are developed in, in such a short amount of time. Some follow-up questions from, from the sort of like collection and then analysis, which mm -hmm. you mentioned just now is then reporting. How do you report your findings and is there a best way of doing that? Um, there's certainly a best way for what you're trying to achieve. So, for example, if you find something that is really interesting for policymakers, for example, for people who manage marine parks, yeah. then it would be best to uh, write it up in, for example, a press release or organize even a conference where you can communicate these results. Um, if it is something that is really interesting for, um, for education, yeah. you could make an uh, edu uh, education program out of it. But for, for science itself, the most important way to communicate our results is through journals, through peer-reviewed okay. articles, where I basically write up my results in a brief report that report is going to go to uh, people who I don't know who they are beforehand. They're going to scrutinize it. They're going to tell me what's good about it, what's wrong about it, if there's anything I need to change. If that passes and I make yep. the changes, if I have to, it's going to be published in those journals, yep. which are really specific for science. Yep. And then we and, and other researchers read those, and that's how we stay up to date with each other's work.
Brilliant. We've got five minutes, ten questions. Are you ready? Yes. Quick fire. Yep. Um, from Boston in the US, uh, London would like to know, are there species of coral that don't have a skeleton? There are, um, but we they're not necessarily the same as the ones that do have a skeleton. So they're in the same sort of group of animals, but they won't be closely related to, say, for example, one of the brain corals. Thank you. River City Science, what is the most difficult part about uh, exploring the Great Barrier Reef? And that's from Silas. The remoteness of it. The Great Barrier Reef is a beautiful reef, but it's very far offshore. So you almost invariably have to take a boat and go about 100 kilometers out before you can actually dive there and see the corals. Okay. Uh, follow up question. Uh, another question. Is it true that if humans touch coral, it will die? Not per se, but I would still recommend never to touch it because you can introduce all sorts of pathogens, bacteria that are on your finger onto the coral. You might damage the tissue, it's very thin and delicate. Um, so it won't per se die, but just to be sure, try never to touch any. Um, uh, Justin in Boston would like to know, so there's no coral bleaching in the winter, is, is that right, or, or less? There are very, very uh, rare cases of cold water bleaching. Um, but they're very, they're greatly outnumbered to the to the hot water uh, okay. bleaching events. Uh, Monica, uh, what do we have to do to close the gap you were talking about? Um, this change, change the change the mindset. Um, get out of the complacency and the comfort zone. Uh, you don't have to make big changes. For example, if you buy a new car, don't buy a diesel. Buy an electric one. You can still drive. You know, you can still charge your mobile phone. Just don't or just try to do it, for example, with solar panels. So it, it's small things, but they amount to really significant changes. Um, Tyler would like to know, how does coral know the shape to grow? Um, and does, it, does where it is or what's next to it change that? It, it could, it could, uh, but those are very subtle changes. So you will not see big changes, like for example, a shrub turn into a tree. What you'll see is rather that if, if I take the shrub tree analogy, that the leaves of the shrub would look rather differently. The, mm -hmm. the overall, uh, the big picture stays the same. But if you really zoom in on the, on the finer scale, you will see these small changes. Brilliant. Uh, Naomi would like to know uh, how long can you spend underwater in a single dive doing the research? So not just doing the research. Yeah. Depends on the depth where you go and how much air you take. Roughly my dives last about an hour and a half. And how much of that time is, is do, doing, doing science? All of it. All of it. <laughs> All of it. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Um, uh, so we've got uh, three questions in two minutes. Um, Everett at River City would like to know what do you guys struggle with most while at sea? Do you get seasick? Um, I don't. Um, what do I struggle with? I get burned easily. Yeah. Yeah, I struggle with that. Um, I need to constantly cover myself. Uh, what else? Uh, Does anything, I mean, we find electronics and seawater and sea spray just really don't like each other. Usually not, yeah. We spend a lot of time waterproofing everything. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Maddox um, would like to know whether you have explored Hawaiian reefs or, or which, is, if you haven't then, which, which other reefs have you been to that you, you want to share? I've, I've snorkeled in Hawaii. I've never done research in a while. I was only there in 2016 for a conference and I took a small holiday at the end of that um, where I went to a few different islands and, and because of the little time I wasn't able to dive there, only snorkeled. Um, where else have I been? Um, a few places in the Caribbean and, and Australia, both the East Coast and the West Coast. Okay. The East Coast has the Great Barrier Reef, yes. West Coast has Ningaloo Reef. Not as beautiful, but way more accessible and, and still incredibly beautiful. Um, last question. This is from Caden at Union Point Academy. Uh, if they became a researcher, how many hours a day are they, are they working? Is it, is it like a full-time job? It's absolutely a full-time job. Somet sometimes slightly more than that. We, uh, I sometimes work Saturday, Sundays. Um, hours often don't get restricted to only eight hours a day sometimes 10 12 if you're in the field go up to 14 16 um, so yeah we spend we spend a lot of time you cannot be a researcher without and something else and and without passion as well because it's a, oh you you'd need to passion but no lack of that fortunately. no lack of that no lack of that 
Rene, thank you so much, um, not only for answering all those great questions coming through from the students, uh, but also for, for that really great step-by-step -step explanation of how increased carbon in the atmosphere has affected the coral reefs and what the future uh, might look like for them. Uh, so thank you once again for being part of Coral Live. Oh, it was a um, pleasure. And it's um, really looking forward to, to, to hearing more about your research as it go, goes and the projects in, in, into the future. Yep. Uh, we're back with uh, two more sessions. Uh, the last two sessions of Coral Live, which are later this afternoon, uh, an adaptation live investigation looking at streamlined sharks and the opportunity perhaps to feed a coral baby. Okay. Um, and that's with Kristen Marhaver um, this afternoon as well. But for now, it's goodbye from Curacao and goodbye from Coral Live. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.